1978, my family and I left Iran with two suitcases. There'd been trouble in Tehran for a while, but that year the trouble just got worse. And we weren't sure how long the trouble would last, but my parents thought it would be better to wait out the chaos uh, and the violence that was happening uh, and return when things got calmer. There wasn't uh, any time to pack, much less to plan. Uh, like a lot of Iranians, we had no idea if when we'd be coming back. We flew to America with those two suitcases. The next year, there was a revolution in Iran. And we unpacked those two suitcases, and then we just cast them off. Never went back to Iran. But some things survived that exodus. Among the few things that survived uh, was a book of poems by a woman named Furuk Farukh Saad. She's known as Furuk to Iranians. Growing up, I'd come across this book every once in a while. And I can still see this isn't the actual book, but it was a lot like this one. I can, I can still in my mind's eye see this woman with bobbed hair and the coal lined eyes. And I remember thinking, who is this? And why had she followed us all the way to America? Why had this woman come with us to America? That image, its glamor, its mystery, its modernity rooted itself in my imagination. But it wasn't until I went to college and I started reading her poems for the first time that my obsession really began with Furu. No sooner had I read her poem, The Sin, than I was possessed by her voice. It was so natural and so authentic and so immediate. I was also bowled over by how audacious she was. The Sin is a poem about sexual desire written from a woman's point of view. I remember thinking, had Iranian women really sounded like this at one time? This February, actually just a couple weeks ago, marks the 51st anniversary since Furuk died. She died on February the 14th of 1967. She was, during her life, she was the most notorious woman in the country. Uh, of Iran, and in the intervening years, she has become one of the most powerful voices for feminism, for social justice, and for human rights. She had burst onto the scene with this poem, The Sin, the same one that I read in college. It was written in this traditional form, quatrains and rhyming couplets, so on the face of it, it just seemed like a conventional love poem. But if you looked closer at it, it dispensed with the usual metaphors for sex and used instead a really direct treatment of the subject. So no, uh, no flowers or you know, vast gardens or whatever other metaphors that were being used. She talked about desire in a very direct way. So this was totally unheard of. This is a time when most people in the country thought women shouldn't say much of anything, much less say that. For some, Furu symbolized the exhilarating possibilities of her times. But for most people, she embodied the corrosion of traditional values under Western influences. There's a word for this, West toxification, uh, is how it's often translated. So Iran being infected by the West, and in particular, America. Predictably enough, she sparked a lot of debate and thundering about the sanctity of marriage and uh, the corrosion of national honor and, oh my gosh, the blighted futures of children if women were to proceed in this vein. Nevertheless, uh, she persisted. You might recognize that line. It's so true of Furuk. Despite this atmosphere that wanted to silence her, she persisted and she continued to write all of her life until she died. For her, the poet's responsibility was to give voice to reality, to her own intimate reality, but also the reality of her society. In one of her later poems, she writes, I must say something, I must say something. In the shivering moment at daybreak, when space blends with something strange, like the portents of puberty, I want to surrender 
to some revolt. I want to stream from that vast cloud. I want to say no, no, no. Her poems still feel really urgent today. They ask questions like, how do we look at women who exercise power by voicing their experience, or trying to? How can a writer resist cultural and political repression? How can a writer or an artist or a citizen bear witness to injustice? For Furour, poetry was a refuge. It was a place where she could flee the strictures of her society, where she could hold the various parts of herself up to a different light, a place where she could take measure of her world. It was also a place where she could scream. And 51 years since her death, those screams of hers, they pierce every boundary between our world and hers, between Iran and America. So my novel, Captive, Song of a Captive Bird, is a novel inspired by Furul's work and her life. It traces the extraordinary ascent of this woman from a 15-year-old bride to one of the most distinguished voices in world literature. It's quite an amazing trajectory. She had a very dramatic life. Um, I chose to write this as fiction, and perhaps we can talk about why later in the question and answer. But the Song of a Captive Bird is a novelization of Furur's life. So I'll read to you briefly from the book, and then, like I say, I'm really happy to answer any questions you might have about it. <clears throat> June of that year, 1963, was a month of martyrs and bloody days. The fires, the murders, the riots, the marches, all seemed part of some progression. Every death was telling some part of our story, which was Iran's story, but nobody could tell how the story would end. We were driven by forces we couldn't understand, moving toward a destination we couldn't see. Those were bitter and black days, full of prophecy and dread, and every face seemed disfigured by grief, confusion, rage. I remember those days and the months that followed. The secret police and government informers were everywhere, their numbers ever increasing. When you heard they were 8,000 strong, 20,000, 60,000, you thought impossible. How could the estimates vary so wildly? But that was the point. Not knowing how many there were, we imagined they were everywhere. They could be anyone, everyone. In prison cells and dark basements, in warehouses and along stretches of barren roads, there were bodies that would never be claimed or tended or buried. We would never witness their tortures, their deaths, nor read or hear of them, but they were there in our silence and in our fear. One afternoon, as I was making my way back to my car from a bookstore near Tehran University, where I'd spent most of the morning, I no noticed that a large number of students had gathered near the university gates. Between the protesters and the onlookers, there were perhaps 300 people in the crowd. There were scattered protests around town then, watched by phalanxes of heavily armed security forces. But a gathering this large was unusual enough to make me stop and stare. Our oil is ours, the students chanted, death to the dictator, democracy for Iran. I pushed past the onlookers and managed to read the demands inscribed on their posters, political reform, greater civil rights, freedom of expression. I shouldered my way through the crowd and crossed the street. My bag was heavy with books, and I stopped at a corner to switch it to my other arm while I fumbled inside for my keys. When I looked back up, Back up, I saw that several cars had stopped along the university gates. A dozen men were clambering onto the sidewalk and running toward the protesters, their guns drawn. With the first shot, my heart gave a kick. Later, everyone reported screams, but I remember there was a long silence before the chaos started. For a moment, I stood there, transfixed by fear, and then I felt myself snap and tingle with life. I tore into an alleyway, my bag thumping against my thigh as I ran. I was nearly to my car when the earth cracked and threw me to the ground and the world went quiet. 
When I opened my eyes, the air was thick with smoke. From somewhere behind me, I heard the sudden rattle of machine gun fire, followed by panicked shouting. I had to get back to my car. Somehow I had to find it. I sprang to my feet and started running again. I'd lost my bag by then, but I'd managed to hold on to my keys. When finally I found the street where I'd parked, I hurled myself into the car and sat gripping the steering wheel, desperate to catch my breath. My wrist was bleeding, but the sensation was far from me, like something I'd left behind in the streets. I peered over the dashboard for signs of life. Nothing. A minute passed, and then I heard shouting and the hard pop of a pistol. I glanced in the rearview mirror, and I saw them, dozens of men running into the street, the scream of sirens at their backs. I started the engine, nosed the car forward, but then there was a hammering against the hood of my car, and I slammed on the brakes. Three men stood in the street, blocking my way. The one in the middle had a wide, wet circle of blood on his chest, and the two others had each grabbed him under the arms and were half carrying, half dragging him toward my car. They looked young, no older than 20, I guessed. One of them had the beginnings of a beard, and another wore glasses with thick black frames. Please, miss, the one with glasses shouted, rapping against the hood of my car. If I had a moment of doubt, it was then. Sitting inside my car and staring at the three men from behind the windshield, who were they and how could I trust them? I might have chosen just then to do something very different from what I actually did, but I couldn't see this moment for what it would mean later for me or for those men. Instead, I shook myself loose from the days that had over stolen over me and pulled the back door open by the latch. They crammed into the car, the back seat, a confusion of arms and legs, and except for their labored breathing and the low, constant moan from the one who'd been shot, they were silent. My hands were shaking, my knuckles bone white as I gripped the steering wheel. Already the air in the car was thick with the tang of sweat. The radio struck up a tune, an airy love song. I slammed the button off. An afternoon in Tehran, a bright sun in a blue sky, streetcars, ice cream vendors, plane trees, a busy city, busy with other stories. I swung left, then right again and into a main thoroughfare. I had no idea where I should go. My only instinct was to keep driving, and it took me a while to work out where I was. It was a relief to fall into traffic, to find myself surrounded by so many other cars and people, and after a few minutes, my grip on the wheel loosened just slightly, and I forced myself to breathe. At Avenue Pahlavi, a car swerved in front of mine coming to a stop at a crooked angle. One door slammed, then two more. Three figures emerged, uniformed, their faces in shadow, their batons raised and ready. In prison, there were things I tried not to think about, but couldn't. Like the three men as they were dragged from my car and into the street, how they were beaten, even the one who couldn't stand, the one with the circle of blood on his chest, their bloodied faces, their torn clothes, their broken bones, their fear. Like Layla in the lake, her screams, her hands. In the cell, a metal cot, a basin, a stool, the stones were damp and stank of urine and rot, and there was a high concrete wall with a square window, no wider than an outstretched hand. I looked down at my clothes, my blouse was splotched with blood, and the blood had dried to a burnt brown. Later, <clears throat> much later, I'd say to the prison walls that it wasn't true what they said about her. It's not true over and over. A key rattled against the lock, interrupting my mad sing-song, and that guard was young, maybe 20. He stopped in front of me, and my gaze traveled from his boots up the length of his uniform to his chiseled jaw, and then finally to his eyes. I remember thinking, what does he want from me? A woman sitting cross-legged on the floor, a woman who talks to walls, who holds her hands up, to the sky as if in prayer. What could he want from me? You're that woman, he said coarsely. I watched his grip tighten on his baton, the poetess. I winced and inched away toward the wall. He lifted the corner of my dress with the baton and then ran it very slowly from my ankle up to my thigh. My father is Colonel Farouk Sod, I started to tell him, but before I could finish, I was kicked 
low and very hard in the stomach, and it knocked the breath out of me, that kick, and the room went black. When I came to, I saw I was alone in the cell. There was a searing pain where the guard's jackboot had struck my stomach. I couldn't pull myself up from the ground. My whole body hurt, not as badly as it would tomorrow or the day after that, but badly enough that all I could do was lie with my eyes to the ceiling, clutching my sides. They kept me separated from the other prisoners in the women's section of the jail, but I heard their voices, their voices, the shuffling of, the bo of their bodies, their cries, their whispers. I shored it all against my despair. That night, memories passed through my mind in the space between one hour and the next so quickly, yet each was rich, vivid, and complete. Entire scenes and conversations surfaced without the slightest omission or abbreviation. Mostly, they were very early memories of my mother's garden, of our big old garden in Amirie, as it was before it was destroyed. I saw it so clearly, the lovely tiled fountain, the high walls draped in honeysuckle and jasmine, the many trees under which my sister and I had once played when we were girls. In the morning there were voices and the beat of boots against stone tiles, and when I woke I saw my father before me with the glint of a tear in his eyes. Poetry could tell every story. I had believed that once. The day my father came for me in prison and took me back to my old house in Amiria, I slept for three hours, woke up, and started to write. It wasn't a poem, but a letter addressed to every country that was not my country. And it was Leila's story, Rahim's story, the story of the prisoner, the three protesters, and every other story that I couldn't tell in a poem, because a poem was a world, and it took time to understand a world, and now, there wasn't any more time. So I'll stop right there. Um, that's uh, from a moment deeper into the book. Uh, but I'm really happy to take your questions about any of what I've told you about the process of writing the book, the story itself. Um, really happy to answer. Yeah. So I do want to ask that question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when Furuk died in 1967, there were so many parts of the story she took with her. And her family was very, very quiet, reluctant to speak about her. Many of her papers disappeared. So there wasn't that much actually known about her. She was mythic, she was iconic, but there were huge tracts of her life that were unaccounted for. And so, as a biographer, that wouldn't do. I'd have to go in search of those parts of the story. Um, and I, by temperament, I'm not a biographer. I like to make things up. <laughs> so I actually, what would have been a biographer's worst nightmare, all these gaps and fissures in the story, are a novelist's dream. All those spaces where there was nothing to do but guess or imagine were the spaces where I could make the story my own. So I chose to write a novel instead of um, a work of nonfiction, and uh, and it's in a sense it's a compromise. There are parts of the story that follow her true story, and then on that I've grafted this other story that's fictional. It's entirely of my own making. Yeah. Thank you. She said it's a wonderful book. If you didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Other other questions to ask? We've got time to fill. Yes. So I think the question is: There's a certain rhythm or musicality to my prose, and I think this is something that people told me with my first book, and I wouldn't have come up with this myself. But um, there was there were there were people who told me your rhythms are the rhythms of Persian. It's like the rhythms of that language, which was my first language could be felt pressing up against my English. <laughs> and so I wasn't consciously aware of it. But it's funny, because when I write about America, I don't think I have that rhythm. But when I go in my imagination to Iran, and I'm thinking in Persian, I think I pick up that rhythm again. Um, so some of it, I think, has to do with the fact that Persian is so deeply imprinted on me as my first language. Though it's no longer my strongest language, it's still deeply imprinted on me. 
The rest of it is work. Uh, the rest of it is sitting. I read my work aloud a lot. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a peculiar madness. I mean, maybe sometimes when I'm stuck in the story, I don't know what to do. I'll just pick pick what I have up and I'll start to read it to myself. And I think that's where I can really fine tune some of the rhythm um, and uh, make sure it's purposeful and um, and it's creating the right effect that I want for a particular scene. So. That's, that's more the craft of it that comes in over the editing process. That's where it comes from. Other questions? Yeah, Miguel. I'm curious to know how and why you decided to tell me in the first person. Yeah, yeah. So originally I had started out, you have to imagine, Furuk is so iconic. It's almost hard to find a corollary in America. Sometimes people say she's like the Sylvia Plath, but I don't think even Sylvia Plath occupies the place that Furuk had in Iran in her time and since then. So this is frightening, too, because you're taking someone who's so beloved, so mythic, so iconic, and uh, you're not, a, not writing even nonfiction. You're making up a fiction. And to do it in the first person is really you know, galling to some people, I think. So I started out in the third person. Uh, because I think I was a tentative, I was a little scared of it. And it read like a biography, it just wasn't alive. And I couldn't really get into her consciousness. The only way to get there was to jump over into the first. So I jumped into the first, and at first I thought, I'll just try this, because as many creative writer, writing teachers will tell you, it either feels right or it doesn't. So it felt right, it felt right, I was trying it out, and at this point, I tried, I stopped thinking that anyone was ever going to read anything I was writing. So now I'm just writing for myself. Because had I been thinking about what people would be thinking about what I was doing, I think the project would have ended right there. Um, and so I switched over into first. I tried to pretend no one, no one would ever read this, while secretly, of course, holding the hope that everyone would. <laughs> um, and uh, and so I, I felt it was right. And, now that I think about it, also part of that decision was that Furu wrote in the first person. Many, many of her poems were written in the first person, and that was part of her innovation and her revolution, was that for the first time you had these poems that didn't couch the feelings or the truth in some kind of generic persona. It was a woman speaking her truth in the first person. It was a tremendous innovation. So it felt of a piece with some of her intentions as an artist. It felt like it was picking up some of those same energies. It was picking up on that bold first person that announces itself in so many of her poems. It felt right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the question was whether I had I've told her family. I haven't. Um, she is now. Nearly everyone in her family has passed away. Now they hadn't when I was still writing the book. I think her mom was still alive at that time. Um, I I never thought to contact them, probably because, <laughs> you know, it would have so intruded on my process. This story I tell in here, it's not the furuk, it's my furuk. It's not history, it's a story. And I think had I started interviewing people or asking permission, then I think um, you would have had a different book, certainly not this one, and not the one I wanted to write, to tell you the truth. Um, and as to whether they've read it, um, I, not that I know of, the book's been out two weeks, so um, you know it can't have made its way. Unfortunately, Iran has no trade agreements with the US, so I can't sell my book, um, I can't sell the rights in Iran. And also, it's the kind of book, um, there are a lot of touchy subjects in here, and politically dangerous subjects. So um, it's not the kind of book that would pro it would not get past the censors. So the only the only scenario I can imagine is if it went underground and was translated. And I suppose I have some secret hope that it might, because it feels like I feel that this story, though I made it my own, in some way its home is Iran. And um, and so 
it is uh, it's a private hope of mine that it might be translated and find its way to Iranians out there. When I when Iranians in America learn about the project, they get really excited because they all know her, and um, and it's really you know I, I find that they have a real emotional attachment. So you can imagine then to to bring the story to Iran where everyone has nearly everyone has a memory of her, a favorite poem of hers. You know, um, they'll just, people, when I tell them Iranians uh, about this project, they'll just spontaneously start to recite verses of her poems. Iranians love poetry, of course. Um, and so it's a very special connection I have to an Iranian reader, and it would be wonderful if it, it, re if it reached there. Um, I, I guess I hope that they will, but I don't know when and if. Yes. Do you know if your son is still alive? Yeah. So uh, the question is about Furu's son. Uh, Furu was married when she was 15 and had a child when she was quite young and divorced, as was the custom and the law of the time. She had no right to see her son once she divorced. The family was also very, as many Iranian families of that time were, they were. Um, to my to my knowledge, they raised the son to to think that Furuk was a woman of ill repute, that she had left him, abandoned him, and so I think um, I think that had really that certainly traumatized Furuk, and it really traumatized the son as well. So though I believe he's alive, um, I don't I don't think that they saw each other. Maybe they saw each other once or twice. After she divorced, um, but when but when she died, he was still a young child, and she hadn't. I don't think she had seen him in a long time. It was probably the deepest loss of her life was the loss of her son. Um, the son did go on years later. He has uh, he has published a collection of Furul's love letters to his father. <laughs> so those um, those exist, and uh, and I think he wanted to. I'm not sure. I mean, I think he wanted to honor her memory, but also his father's memory, uh, to to show that that was a true and deep love, even though she had left that marriage. So that is a legacy that the son has left behind. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so with this book, it took four years to write it. There were a lot of interruptions. I have a child. I take care of my mom. I teach. I had moved across the country. So there were a lot of intervals where I wasn't actively working on it. Um, and I think uh, really it was that last of the four years, it was the last year or so when I really buckled down and I began to treat it like a job. So I'd go to the, that space that you're talking about on social media uh, and I would plant myself there from nine to three. Those are my hours. And some days I managed to squeeze out 10 words and other days it might be I guess if I'm lucky, a hundred. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, but it, but that sitting down is really important. So that I think what happens when I did that is because I'm just getting ten or a hundred words out at each session. But I think what happens when you work daily and steadily in that way, your subconscious works on it even when you're not sitting at the table, at the desk. Yeah. So, uh, so it was gestating overnight and I could then return to it the next day and get the next 10 or 100 words out of it. Um, the Something magical then happened, which is that I was able to sell the book and then I had an editor who was waiting for the book. And as anyone who's had a wonderful creative writing teacher or worked with an editor knows, that is such a tremendous gift to a writer. Somebody waiting like this for what you have is transformative. So once she came on board and she loved what was there, she really helped usher the book toward its ending. The last maybe 100 pages of the book hadn't been written at that point. But I was able to write them more quickly because she was encouraging me. And she was so passionate about um, my editor, Andra Miller, was really passionate about Furu's story. She got it. 
and she was waiting for me to give it to her. <laughs> so, um, so that was really wonderful. And I think if I, if I calculate, I probably did half or more of the work in that last year as I was working with Andra that I did on my own <laughs> when I was, um, when I was working without an editor. So that was a really, it was a really wonderful gift to have an editor who was so enthusiastic come on board. Um, so that's my, my process. And then I was, when I finished my, when I finished this novel, I was sort of like, it's sort of like being, you know, in good shape. Like you've been working out every day. So I was in good shape and, um, and I didn't want to waste it. I wanted to keep going. So I almost immediately, there's a huge lag between when a book is finished and it comes out. In my case, it was nearly 16 months. I finished this book 16 months ago and it's just come out. Um, so you can go, you can go mad in that time, um, or, or you can get busy writing something else. And since I felt I had, I'd really gotten into good shape and I was in a certain, I had certain momentum going, I started right away. I was writing, um, I started right away. And, and so the lesson in all this for me has been to, even if it's not nine to three, if it's nine to 10 or later in the evening, to keep some connection alive every day to the project. Uh, and that, that I think is for me really, really important to not let long gaps of time fall. I think if you're away a week, it takes two weeks to get back into it. If you're away a month, two months. And so it goes, right? Um, so I try to, I try to work on what I'm working on a little bit every day. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you so much. It was a really pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.